Welcome to my second video on differential diagnosis, where I will look at the history and the role of physiognomy in traditional Chinese medicine. The first words of the preface to Zhang Zhongjing's Shang Han Lun are an exhortation to physicians to be brilliant in their profession. They recall two anecdotes from the life of the legendary Chinese physician, Bian Chue, also known as Yu Ren, whose skill in pulse taking and in particular of assessing patients' health by their appearance, is presented as an example for all doctors to follow. The first words of the preface state, Every time I think of Yueren going to the dukedom of Guo to examine patients, or when he observed the Marquis of Qi's countenance, never can I escape deep feeling as I sigh in admiration of this excellent talent. The legends surrounding Bian Chue were recorded by China's first historian, Sima Qian, early in the Han Dynasty. Sima Qian gives us the story of Bian Chue's interaction with the Marquis Huan of Qi. In his first audience with the Marquis, Bian Chue, by simple observation, informs him that he has an illness in the fibers of his skin. The Marquis responds by saying he feels well and suspects that Bian Chue is trying to trick him for profit. In an audience five days later, Again, just by observation, Bian Chue tells him his illness is now located in his blood vessels, and if it is not cured, it will go deeper. In the next audience, Bian Chue informs him that the illness is now in his stomach. Each time, the Marquis was more and more displeased. In the final interview, Bian Chue observed him from a distance and hurried away. Five days later, the Marquis started to feel ill and subsequently died. Bian Chue said, When illness is in the fibers of the skin, decoctions can reach it. When illness is in the blood vessels, needles can reach it. When illness is in the stomach, alcoholic brews can reach it. But when it is in the bones, even the controller of destiny cannot do anything about it. We spend so much of our lives seeing people's faces and living with their personalities that it's not surprising that people have tried to determine if there's a relationship between the face and a person's character. To take a closer look at physiognomy, it's worth looking at the distinction between physiognomy, phrenology and craniometry, as they're interrelated. Craniometry is the activity of measuring the cranium and drawing conclusions from these measurements. It is a subset of anthropometry, which is the measurement of all the physical properties of the human body. It was developed by Alphonse Bertillon to help distinguish criminals who use various alibis. Today, this activity is an accepted scientific tool that has given us useful hypotheses in the evolution of human beings and is actively used in forensic criminology. Phrenology is the study of the shape and anomalies on the skull. This study claims to give indications of mental faculties, character traits and abilities. Phrenology was based on the idea that the brain consisted of muscular-like areas which corresponded to certain characteristics of the mind and frequent usage of those areas could affect the shape of the skull. Phrenology was developed by the physiologist Franz Josef Gall in the early 19th century and enjoyed periods of popularity in the 19th and 20th century. It has since largely been discredited. Nonetheless, Gall made a number of valid contributions to the fields of psychology, anthropology and sociology. Physiognomy, in its broadest sense, is the study of the features of the body, especially the face, and their relationship to various human attributes, such as character, mental faculties, health, that is diagnostics and prognostics, and fate. In ancient times, physiognomists would evaluate all of these attributes. Nonetheless, most of the interest in this art would focus on the determination of their character and also on their fate, which meant that this skill was easily abused by unscrupulous practitioners. In this video, I will mainly be concerned with what can be read from the face, with an emphasis on patient health and prognosis. Although given its history, I can't ignore physiognomy's association with character and fate. The 
word physiognomy comes from the Greek phusis, meaning nature, and gignosko, I know, distinguish, or learn. Our word to know derives from this root. Physiognomy has a very long history. There is evidence in clay tablets of its practice dating from the old Babylonian Empire, that is, some 4,000 years ago. There is a legend that a Syrian magician by the name of Zopyrus practiced physiognomy in Athens, where he read the character of Socrates and prophesied his death. The first textual manual appears in the writings of the school of Aristotle in a work called Physiognomics. The explanation of its methods is prophetic in the way this art would be practiced and perceived throughout history. The first method was based on the various genera of animals, the second method distinguished various races of men. The third method took inspiration from the different conditions of the mind. Though popular for predicting both character and fate up to late Roman times, from the Middle Ages onwards, physiognomy had a checkered history. At first, it was taught at universities and generally accepted, even appearing in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. However, because of its misuse, it was banned by King Henry VIII of England. Since that time, Western physiognomy has focused mainly on character and personality. In 1586, the Italian scholar Giambattista della Porta published De Humana Physiognomonia. This book contains numerous illustrations of physiognomic traits. This was to influence Johann Lovatar in the 18th century, who was to become a great promoter of physiognomy. Physiognomy was extensively used by writers in the 19th century to produce engaging descriptions. These helped support common conceptions linking facial features to personality. Sir Francis Galton looked for a more scientific foundation in physiognomy and investigated health, beauty and criminality through the use of composite photography. Pioneering work was also done by Cesare Lombroso, who was a doctor and professor of forensic medicine Unfortunately, both men's works have been used to support racist supremacist theories. In more recent times, the advent of facial recognition and machine learning has given rise to large databases which are now available for research. This has confirmed certain statistical characteristics and given rise to some business opportunities, but at the same time created controversies. Chinese philosophy, the face can be interpreted as one of the microcosms reflecting different aspects of the universe, both in space and in time. These relationships mimic fractals and can also be seen in terms of synchronicity. Thus, if properly interpreted, the face can reveal not only what is happening within the body, but also reflects the past and the future. The physiognomy of the face is called Mian Xiang. The art of making interpretations of the face for fortune-telling is called Xiang Shu. This was performed by Xiang Shi or Masters of Inspection. Many texts reveal that mantic physiognomy was practiced from the earliest historical times in China. Perhaps the earliest record is found in the Zuo Zhuan, where Gong Sun Ao learned that the envoy Shu Fu was a master of physiognomy. He introduced his two sons and Shu Fu made predictions about them. Another early reference is the story of the famous physiognomist Gu Bu Zheqing, which comes down to us in the historical records of the Zhao family, which are part of Sima Qian's history of China. Around 500 BCE, Zhao Jianzi summoned his children to meet Gu Bu Zheqing, who examined them and informed him that none of them would become a general. He then pointed out one of his bastard children, and he prophesied that he would be a general which turned out to be the case. There are many such anecdotes, and it should be pointed out that such practitioners use many methods to come up with their predictions. Both books of the Huang Di Neijing give us some account of the use of physiognomy in a medical context. Chapter 29 of the Ling Shu explains that the doctor would not be allowed to touch the body of a king or an aristocrat, and so would have to rely on physiognomy like Bian Chue. Chapter 49 of the Ling Shu 
explains the significance of different sections of the face and the meaning of different complexions. These and other explanations show the extensive influence of the Wuxing or Five Transformation theory. There are two main sources for further documentation on the art and physiognomy in China. The Dunhuang manuscripts found in the Mogao caves along the Silk Route are a trove of information from the 5th to the 11th centuries CE. This Buddhist complex was abandoned and rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century. The other source is the Shenxiang Quan Bian, or the Compendium of Divine Physiognomy, which was published early in the Ming Dynasty. This is the oldest extant manual on Chinese physiognomy, and old versions of this book can be found in Taiwan and Japan. As it includes some of the Dunhuang information, I will focus on this source. The compendium was compiled around 1439, early in the Ming Dynasty, by Yuan Zhongchi. The text claims the author was Chen Tuan, and that it was transmitted by Yuan Liu Zhuang, the father of the book's compiler. Both father and son were famous physiognomists and government officials. The father apparently recognized Zhu Di as the future Ming emperor, encouraging him to usurp the throne. Yuan Zhongchi served both Zhu Di and subsequent emperors, retiring in 1439 to write the compendium. The supposed author, Chen Tuan, was a 10th century Taoist monk who practiced the Yijing and made successful prophecies concerning important government officials. Chen Tuan apparently learnt from Tang Dynasty physiognomists Liu Dongbin and Mai Yi on Mount Hua. Shenxiang Chuan Bian cites many renowned physiognomists going back to the Han Dynasty, such as Tang Ju and Xu Fu. It's worth saying a few words about the context in which this book appears. Up to the Ming Dynasty, physiognomy had been a guarded secret maintained within the family, or practiced by monks. Physiognomists were held in high esteem by the rulers, who trusted their advice. There was no incentive to share this valuable knowledge with the general public. With the invention of printing in the Song Dynasty, Chinese officials set about compiling and editing the treasures of their literature. Gradually, an affluent and educated middle class began to appear. This class was very concerned with upward mobility and looked to esoteric practices for predictions about the future of their families. It was probably in response to this kind of interest that the Shenxiang Quan Bian was compiled. This slide shows the structure of the book and the topics that it deals with. The first chapters give extensive excerpts attributed to the masters I have just mentioned. Other chapters focus on the characteristics of the face and different parts of the body. In general, this book shows that the art owes much to the theory of the five transformations, or Wu Xing. Chapter 12, in particular, focuses on color and the analysis of qi. Although the Shenxiang Quan Bian gives us a lot of information, it certainly didn't reveal all the secrets of the art. Such secrets are to this day guarded within each family. Nevertheless, according to anthropologist William Lesser, the physiognomy practiced to this day in Taiwan is broadly based on the principles appearing in the Shenxiang Chuan Bian. The Chinese give a very down-to-earth argument in favor of physiognomy. A good farmer can determine whether a melon is good or bad, raw or ripe, bitter or sweet, just by looking at its exterior. A good horse merchant can evaluate a horse's potential from its shape, coat, demeanor, and other physical characteristics. In the same way, a good physiognomist can evaluate a person's health, character, and potential. We should return to our definitions, as many statements are made about physiognomy without clarification as to what they're referring to. I will focus on the face, as this part of the body is most readily visible and most commented on. I will address these three potential objectives for physiognomy. Although there is a lot of anecdotal evidence in Chinese texts for the prediction of fate and destiny using physiognomy, this kind of evidence can be criticized on many levels. 
especially if the purpose of the stories is to promote an iconic person. In fact, the Chinese philosopher Shunzi was the first to write a treatise criticizing physiognomy. If we take a scientific approach, no relationship can be associated between the face and our fate or destiny. However, the fact remains that physiognomists such as Yuan Zhongchi held high positions and would have paid with their lives if their predictions had proved wrong. Their careers would have been cut short if their predictions relied purely on chance. With respect to character and personality, we all intuitively practice a form of physiognomy when we meet a new person. A subjective general determination is prone to chance and error, as most of us have experienced. Nevertheless, the face undergoes clearly identifiable variations throughout our lives, caused by repetitive muscle movements from our facial expressions and loss of skin elasticity. This information would allow an experienced observer to make certain conclusions about an elderly person's character and personality with some accuracy. Such predictions concerning younger persons would be more questionable. As concerns the analysis of mental faculties, there are distinct facial features associated with certain extreme problems of mental health, which are not at issue in this video. Nonetheless, many other troubling mental health problems may not immediately be severe, but will have important consequences. Such problems are often reflected in the eyes and in the pulse. With respect to physical health, there are a number of well-documented indicators that are recognized by Western medicine. Frank's sign, or the earlobe crease, is seen as an indicator of coronary artery atherosclerosis or other cardiac issues. Queen Anne's sign, or the thinning of the exterior eyebrow, is associated with hypothyroidism or atopic dermatitis. Facial color can also give preliminary clues in both forms of medicine. A red complexion can be associated with a heart problem. A dark blue-green complexion can indicate a liver problem. In either case, a single indicator may not be adequate or may sometimes be irrelevant. For many practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine, there are three useful indicators for diagnostics. The ear is an indicator of the jing, or roughly speaking, the essence. The cheeks can be an indicator for the qi, although they can be influenced by many factors. The eyes are an excellent indicator of the shen, or spirit. In general, doctors will say that the patient, in 80% of cases, will verbally give an accurate account of their medical problem that will help in their diagnosis. So why should doctors be concerned about physiognomy? Perhaps the simplest answer is to look at the work of Dr. Joseph Bell, the Edinburgh pathologist who inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. We could say that physiognomy is to some degree an art. There are many artists and musicians whose skill in the arts would appear to defy scientific analysis. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you'll join me for future videos in this series.